this is on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to say, first of all, I'm honored to be here as part of the Joanne Berkeley Bioethics Symposium um, and uh, part of the conversation that the Center for Bioethics has been so instrumental in not just uh, starting but certainly continuing. Um, I want to apologize for those of you who were at the uh, dinner last night because uh, some of what I have to say will be a little bit uh, redundant, but um, I hope I have a little more time so I can flesh out some of the nuances in what I could only kind of skim over last night. <clears throat> Secondly, another apology for those of you who have lived um, and practiced uh, much of the history, or at least part of the history that I'm going to tell. Um, and I apologize not because I'm going to be restating the world that you are familiar with, but because um, I'm going to be doing a political interpretation of the world around the problem of pain. Uh, and how the world around the problem of pain, the cultural and the political disputes in American society over the last 70 years have shadowed and shaped the kinds of challenges um, that, the, that, uh, that Myra just referred to. Finally, I, I want to say that um, I started this project because I was interested in a particular practitioner named uh, John Bonica, who uh, is regarded in some ways as a leading uh, figure in the focus and the early creation in the 1950s and beyond on pain as a legitimate uh, focal point of medical practice. I myself became surprised to the extent to which the story that started for me as a clinical story moved into the political realm and ultimately into the legal realm. And I hope what I can give you today is once again a very sort of quick overview of the book and uh, some insights of the lessons I've learned by doing the pain, the political history. Uh, the thing that got me interested in the book was a, a question that I was familiar with because of previous work I'll get to in a moment, which is why is pain such a topic of controversy over such a long period of time in American society? And this New Yorker cartoon for me really captured at least one feature of the dilemma. The doctor is standing over the patient's bedside with the wife nearby and he says we can give you enough medication to alleviate the pain, but not enough to make it fun. And as I said last night, one of the questions for physicians hovering over the bedside and for society writ large is, where is the line? Is it actually a discernible line between pain relief, compassionate pain relief, and the creation of illegitimate pleasure? Who is to judge uh, where that line exists? One of the challenges of pain in general, chronic pain and pains of very many kinds, is that it defies standards of measurement that physicians are comfortable with. Uh, the, problem of Ill, uh, the problem of measurement, that is to say it's necessarily subjective, you're highly dependent as a practitioner on individual patients and what you might call secondary indices of pain. We don't have measures of, it doesn't, it's not a vital sign in the same sense that temperature, blood pressure are vital signs. And as a result, a certain amount of judgment, trust, compassion, and leaps of intersubjective understanding are necessary as you hover over that patient's bedside and consider what dose of medicine is needed. Shadowing over the history of pain has always been the fear of drug addiction. Tolerance, dependence, and addiction, which of course varies by individual, can be overstated in the popular conversation around pain. But clearly the anxieties around drugs is unquestionably a crucial part of what complicates that patient, that doctor, as he or she makes a judgment about pain and relief. Added to that in the 1990s, we have other controversies that skew the pain debate in new directions. End of life politics, emerging in places like Michigan, New York, and most notably in Oregon, uh, really bring pain medicine to a new realm and create new sets of controversies. Morphine used at the end of a person's life with a terminal illness uh, is, in one, in one view, crucial compassionate care. But for those who object to the Oregon Death with Dignity Act, it was seen as a slippery slope towards euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. It suppresses blood pressure, it can inhibit respiration. Where is the line, once again, that blurry line, not between fun and relief, but where is the line between physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, and compassionate pain relief? 
You might say that all of these are moral and cultural debates that have shaped and are always present in the way Americans have debated pain and pain relief. Um, and so when I start, started this project, I was interested in the moral and the political debates that you might say descend and hover around that physician as he makes decisions and also hover around the patient as they decide how much to complain, what to ask for in terms of relief. And underpinning this, there's another problem, which is whose pain is real, who deserves relief, and how much relief is too much relief. So the book I wrote is really about how this issue has moved from science to medicine to politics and ultimately to law. Now, I became interested in this because of a previous book I'd written on the history of sickle cell disease called Dying in the City of the Blues, a disease that's characterized by recurring infections, early mortality, but also recurring painful crises. And in writing that book, I became aware of the fact that in the 1960s, sickle cell disease was emerging in both popular and clinical understanding, despite the fact that it's discovered in the US in 1910, it emerges in the 1960s, you might say consistent with the cultural and political trends of that era as a new disease characterized by pain and suffering among African Americans that had long been ignored. You could say its rising awareness both in medicine and society, echoed many of the political and cultural currents of that era in the time of civil rights, activism, et cetera. So it's in this context that I followed a particular practitioner, a pathologist named Lemuel Diggs, who actually, when I started this research, he was born in 1900, he was still alive in 1992 when I began the research. And he pointed out to me that, you know, how sickle cell researchers thought about what was too much relief or too little relief varied by region. He once said that the people in Oakland and Chicago disagree with us here in Memphis, a more conservative kind of Bible Belt community. They think that we undertreat people in sickle cell pain, and we think they overtreat people in sickle cell pain. It's this early observation that kind of introduced me to the idea that pain has a political and cultural component to it, that the decisions that physicians make at the bedside reflect local cultural values. And it's also by tracking the history of debates about people in sickle cell pain that you could see that by the 1990s you were entering a new political era, a new environment, where patients found themselves confronted by a little more frustration and skepticism as they entered the ER. Um, a patient, perhaps from a poor community in an urban center, goes to the ER seeking uh, medication for their sickle cell crises has to endure a different kind of challenge. Is this a person truly in pain? Are they faking the pain? Are they drug seekers? Is this a chronic disease problem? Or is this a part of the drug problem? As one um, patient, uh, actually this is from a early 1990s uh, uh, journal, uh, a caption underneath the cover of my book, the, the image was in a magazine and the caption underneath read, before you can get past the agony, you have to convince a doctor that it's real. So it's this highly specific debate about race and pain that got me interested in the broader history of what kinds of political and cultural and medical and scientific controversies have shadowed not just people in sickle cell pain, but many people in pain. The question of whether it was real, how aggressively it should be treated, what mix of narcotics was necessary to endure or to be relieved of a particular crisis. Pain, you could say, you know, show, re reveals a fundamental conceptual problem. Is it a sign? Is it like blood pressure and pulse, respiration and temperature? Is it necessarily related to pathology? Or is it, as many have argued historically, subjective and therefore undependable? Are complaints evidence of maladjustment or malingering? It requires a certain element of intersubjective understanding. Another New Yorker cartoon, no, they're not like us. They don't feel pain. So when John Bonica, the person who I follow in this book, uh, was asked about this issue in the 1970s in the US News and World Report, he hey, was asked, what is pain, Dr. Bonica? Can science actually define the sensation? He admitted, 
despite the fact that he was seen as the leader of the pain field, an internationally recognized expert, if you ask 100 different authorities that question, you would get 100 different answers. Pain exposes the problem of judgment, of how you weigh objective and subjective evidence. And as I said, as I did this book, I realized that this problem not only exists in medicine, it exists in law, it exists in politics, and it exists in society. And the thing that really stunned me as I did this research is how much the question of judging pain and figuring out how much relief people in chronic pain deserves didn't come to rest in the clinic. It didn't stay in the bedside. It moved into politics, and ultimately, it was judges. It was the courts. And so what started as a history of medicine and became a history of politics ultimately also became a history of our judicial system, of law. What I want to do is very quickly give you an overview of that history from the post-World War II era when soldiers come back home from the war and when John Bonica, as somebody who worked as a World War II soldier, uh, became interested in how to adequately care for patients, uh, veterans whose bodies were racked uh, by, the, by, the, uh, by the problems associated with their war injuries. It's an era in the post-World War II era where pain, you might say, is just emerging as a barely legitimate topic in American medicine, where surgeons, pharmaceutical companies, psychiatrists, and others are debating what to make of this new problem. As I said, this is when John Bonica begins his work at Fort Madigan Army Hospital in Fort Lewis in Washington. He later becomes the chief of anesthesia there and then ultimately defines a new pain clinic in uh, University of Washington in Seattle uh, in the 1950s into the 1960s. But it starts with the treatment of hundreds of soldiers with severe intractable pain and his work on analgesic nerve block. Then I'll move off into the 1960s and 70s, which unquestionably sees the emergence of pain as a legitimate field. Uh, in a new liberal era, of pain theory and practice, symbolized by the rise of gate control theory, and a world of other approaches to pain relief. And this really runs into new political and cultural currents, not just in medicine, but as you'll see in politics and society, with a rise of a new kind of conservative attitude towards whether we're giving people in pain too much relief, and what the cost of the relief that we've, 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 uh, we've created might be. And I'll end by a couple of comments about how pain continues to be politicized today, pain at the end of life, the emergence in the religious right of an argument about fetal pain, uh, medical marijuana for chronic pain, and Oxycontin and the politics of prescription drug abuse. So very quickly, after the war, uh, it's really um, Dr. Bonica begins the process of putting together a multidisciplinary pain clinic idea where neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, and other medical colleagues come together at the Tacoma Community Hospital. In 1953, he publishes uh, what ought, later becomes known as the Bible of Pain Management, the management of pain. He's appointed as the chair of anesthesiology in 1961 at University of Washington. And by the 1970s, um, with the foundation, the creation of the International Symposium on Pain, uh, I, IASP, and launches the journal uh, Pain. It's really by the 1970s he's called the father of pain medicine. And over the next 20 years, his clinic evolves into a national model of patient care and teaching. By the end of his life in the 1980s, and uh, he dies in the 1990s, he's an advisor to the ministry, ministries of education and health in eight foreign countries, and really seen as a national figure in the politics and the management of pain. I'll follow his life, but I'll also follow his life, you might say, and the times. Um, when he begins his work in the 1950s, pain, as I said, is an unquestionably important quality but there's a lot of political as well as clinical controversy over what this problem is. On the one hand, you have a Boston psychiatrist who writes in the late 1950s, the relief of pain is obviously one of the main functions of physicians, but ironically, he said, it is one of the things we do least well, partly because we don't understand it. But even more important are ideas like this coming out of psychiatry, the work of Henry Albranda at a California pain symposium in the late 1950s, in which he argues that the patient in chronic pain is certainly worthy of study, but not necessarily worthy of sympathy. 
And this is a widespread uh, notion within psychiatry that the chronic pain complainant is to be looked at with a certain degree of clinical skepticism. He writes, complaints of chronic pain may develop in the child brought up to repress feelings of hatred, who then may use complaints of pain to cover his hostile feelings towards an associate. Malingering, masochistic self-punishment, underlies the chronic painful condition. For many psychiatrists coming out of the war, embracing a kind of psychodynamic model of what pain complainants are and who they are, this model of kind of chronic pain complainant as an aspect of, uh, as a function of maladjustment was really part of the way in which they regarded people who complained about pain uh, and who refused to kind of buck up. Many of the physicians in this time period were concerned about an overly liberal society, too much coddling, and the importance of uh, getting veterans back to work and getting chronic pain complainants back to work. Now, these issues, malingering and deception, playing sick, have not disappeared entirely from American medical or cultural discourse, but they were really prominent in the 1950s. It might surprise many of you to know that surgery, neurosurgery, played a central role in thinking about the care of people in chronic pain at the end of life, with lobotomies and chordotomies emerging after World War II as the leading edge, so to speak, of pain management. Writing in 1960 in the Annals of the New York Academy of Science, for the patient in chronic pain, one author wrote that certain aspects in perceptual style, which are changed by the prefrontal lobotomy carry out for the relief of pain, are precisely those that differentiate within the normal population, those who can tolerate pain well, from those who suffer from it greatly. This is a kind of a neurosurgical, neurosurgical view of where pain exists in the frontal lobe and how it can be treated, particularly for patients who are dying who need relief. Pain management, surgery played a central role in the 40s and into the 1950s in pain relief. And it's interesting that um, the, the thinking about uh, what was necessary for those patients really organ was organized around a surgical model. A person who is exceptionally tolerant of pain, says this author, has the personality and perceptual style of the individual after a prefrontal lobotomy whereas one who cannot tolerate pain resembles in personality a patient before a prefrontal lobotomy. I'm not sure that's a really helpful model for us today, but you can see it's a central way of thinking about who experiences pain, who complains, and who does not. The irony is the argument for a lobotomy for people in terminal cancer stages was that it didn't remove the pain, it removed the worry, anxiety, and the complaining. As many neurosurgeons argued, People still said they were in pain. They simply didn't complain about it as much. Now, the other edge, the other controversial development in the post-World War era was unquestionably the rise of the pharmaceutical industry. With oxycodone making its appearance in this time period, then under the brand name Percodan, uh, brought to you by the Endo Company. It was seen as acting fast, lasting long, bringing thorough relief, as good as morphine, and there's been always a search for the alternative to morphine, but does not produce respiratory depression. The argument in the late 1950s is that it was well tolerated, and here's a particular model of addiction that prevailed, that it was, the drug was broken down extremely slowly, and as a result produced, the argument was little euphoric effect, and addiction should not be the problem. It's a particular model of addiction that says the faster a drug is broken down, the higher the euphoria, the greater the likelihood of addiction. We know that not to be the case. But on the basis of this, Percodan becomes yet another leading but also controversial edge of how we tackle pain. So not just the psychi psychiatric model of pain or the surgical model of pain, but now the pharmacological model of pain. And by the early 1960s, um, people like Stanley Moss, the state attorney general in California, are raising concerns about the high-powered campaign waged by the endo company among doctors and pharmacists bemoaning the drug company's apparent influence on the California Medical Association over the question of whether Percodan should be highly controlled or lightly controlled. And he was arguing for it to become more strongly controlled in the early 1960s. Um, these are the kinds of controversies that circulate around people in chronic pain in the 1950s, early 1960s. The question of 
oxycodone or Percodan's addictive potential, a swirling into the political realm in the early 1960s in California, but also elsewhere. Raising questions about drug control, what level of prescription control was needed, uh, what's the, how is it connected to other problems in society. As I mentioned last night, Edward Bloomquist, writing for a committee on dangerous drugs for the California Medical Association, would note, the drug has acquired the unenviable status in California of being the principal choice of a substitute for heroin. So whereas today we think of oxycodone and heroin having a different relationship, uh, at this point, oxycodone leading to heroin, in that point, the, the, at that time, the period the, of the concern was uh, heroin users turning to oxycodone. It's a reflection of changing times, he writes. It may seem odd that California has become the center of Percodan misuse. Two factors, however, contribute to this. California has an undue share of unstable personalities, he writes, who welcome bizarre methods of escaping reality. It really is a sign of things to come, actually, if you're, considered, if you're thinking about the California Bay Area in the early 1960s. But the argument is, should this drug be more strictly controlled? So you might say that in every realm of society, there are debates about what pain is, how it should be measured, and how it should be managed. And even at the US Congress, there's uh, calls for an inquiry on Percodan. Now, much of this atmosphere changes in, as I move to the second part of my story, which is the new liberal era that emerges in the 1960s. And unquestionably, one of the catalysts for this is a new theory of pain not the addiction theory of pain and not the psychiatric theory of pain and not the neurosurgical theory of pain, but what's called the gate control theory of pain. Its creators are a psychologist and a physiologist coming from outside of these medical fields, articulating Ronald Melzack and Patrick Wall a particular view, that the surgical view is wrong, that the concept of there being a pain center in the brain is totally inadequate to account for the sequence of behavior and experience. Indeed, they argue the concept is pure fiction. The thalamus, the limbic system, the hypothalamus, the parietal cortex, and the frontal cortex are all implicated in pain perception. It isn't located in any one place. They also argue that the pharmac pharmacological theory is too narrow, that pain is more than just stimulus, nerves, spinal cord, and brain. And here is what they offer, a kind of a truly multidisciplinary, but also varied subjective understanding of what pain is. Pain, they say, is individual psychology, it's neurophysiology, it's past history. You've had an experience in the past with pain and you see it coming at you again. You are likely to experience it differently than if you'd never had that experience before. It's the context in which you experience pain. And it's also a set of personality traits that all shape pain perception. What the gate control theory turns the attention to is pain perception. Sorry. Um, and this is kind of the model. This is what you see lots of models. It's a kind of electrical model of pain where the gates open and close uh, based on all of these different factors, uh, speeding transmission to pain perception. Ronald Melzack is a critic of surgery, psychiatry, and drugs in pain relief he saw the emphasis on surgery and anesthetic nerve block as historical accidents. He said if we could, they just happened to be dominant ways of thinking about pain coming out of World War II. And he says if we can recover from historical accident, and I guess this is a lesson for all of those who seek reform in this realm, we can always recover from historical accident. Other methods deserve more attention than they have received. Uh, this is an image of him uh, in a Canadian broadcast of the film The Puzzle of Pain. He was at McGill at this time. And looked at from the standpoint of the 1970s, he declares that he was astonished by the acceptance of this theory. It, he says, rode it on a zeitgeist. And if you want to understand the shifts in this pain theory, its uptake, you have to see it as a byproduct of changing cultural and political trends in the 1960s. Now, why did pain theory matter so much? Well, it mattered in the law because of the following. Henry Albranda, writing in California in the late 50s, was concerned with the fact that the California state uh, legislature had passed a new disability rights benefit, a disability benefit. And in 1956, President Eisenhower had signed into law something that was dramatically new, into the Social Security Act a disability benefit that was to be administered by the US Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, now called HHS. 
Um, and at the centerpiece of this was, and I don't want to get into the back and forth, but he's really pressured to do this um, in an election year, 1956, as he's coming up for re-election. He himself, by the way, has just suffered a heart attack. There's a debate about how disabled he is. He's on pain meds. He doesn't want to do this because he's pressured by the AMA to stand firm. Truman had pushed for national health insurance. This was an effort in that direction, not full health insurance, but a new benefit for people who were disabled. He's being pushed by a very crafty Senate majority leader named Lyndon Baines Johnson. And he's also being pushed by one of the senators uh, in, the, in, the, in the Senate this time, a guy named John F. Kennedy. And he is really outmaneuvered in that election year, and he's compelled not to stand, he cannot stand in the way of that piece of legislation, so he signs it reluctantly in the hope that it would never become as expansive as it is. The AMA really sees this as a travesty. And physicians, by and large, are puzzled over the question of what will this mean for them in their efforts to judge who is truly disabled. This is one of their concerns, right? This is the kind of liberalization of society, the creation of a coddling society that is only gonna produce greater government programs and more dependence. By 1959, you have one of the, not the first, but one of many claimants that turn their attention and seek this new disability benefit, and her case becomes a test case of the new trends in society. The case is Paige V. Zelabrizi, and she's a Texas housewife, Rosie Pays, who has arthritis with what physicians call a marked psychogenic overlay of her symptoms. And one of the key questions about her case is, is there enough objective evidence to call this disabling pain, or is it a psychological and psychiatric problem? She applies for benefits, she's rejected by HEW, and many people who are so rejected turn to the federal courts. This is a new avenue that's created by the disability benefits. And there's a judicial ruling in 1963 on her claims to disability that becomes a landmark in the recognition of subjective pain as real pain. It's written by this judge, John Brown, a Republican appointee by Eisenhower. Uh, he himself is involved with He's a Republican himself, but he's a Republican cut from a very different era who sees, he, his clerk once said to, that he felt that it was the responsibility of people to be their brother's keeper, but not everybody had a right to be kept. And drawing a line was really key for him. And in his ruling, he said the following, if pain is real to the patient, the disability entitles the person to the statutory benefits, the fact that pain complained of by a claimant is not shown by objective clinical and laboratory findings does not mean that HEW must give little weight to allegations thereof. This question about objective versus subjective evidence would become the centerpiece of clinical and political dispute for the next following decades. But this really opened the doors for subjective pain to be deemed to be legitimate pain. Through the 1960s, you see other liberalizing trends in society, recognizing individual pain, subjective pain, as legitimate pain. There's the publication, for example, of a, mark, a work by uh, an anthropologist named Mark Zabrowski called People in Pain. He does a study in the VA hospitals uh, in New York, and he looks at different groups. Looked in, at, in retrospect, this is either the recognition of what we might call cultural difference in pain or the crudest form of ethnic stereotyping. It's both. He studies Jews, he says they're vocal, they're suspicious of doctors, and they're always concerned about pain. Italians, he says, are vocal and trusting, but very present-oriented. If the pain is here, they complain. If it's past, they stop complaining. He talks about Irish as being kind of pathologically stoic in some ways. They ignore pain as if it doesn't exist, and they're highly phys suspicious of physicians as well. And the old Americans, it won't surprise you, he means Anglo-Americans, it won't surprise you, embody a kind of ideal patient in pain. They complain when necessary, but they're able to rationalize it and ignore it under other circumstances. And they're regarded by physicians as ideal patients, right? So the, the point is that he's highlighting the, the importance of cultural difference and cultural sensitivity in understanding what people 
experience, but also what they communicate about pain. There are other signs, and this book is really taken up as a, not a new Bible, but an important reference point in understanding the importance of diversity in clinical situations. There are also other developments. Um, the model that John Bonica creates becomes more widely developed, the multidisciplinary pain clinic. This is a period when uh, a sociologist named Isabel Basinger has written, a historical sociologist, about the invention of pain medicine as a field, the rise of the multidisciplinary pain clinic, but it also is the era that sees the rise of patient-controlled analgesia, which shows up in multiple places, in Leeds, England, in Canada, in Menlo Park, and in New York City at the same time. And the argument here is part of the culture of the time period, which is why debate how much pain somebody is in, just hand them the morphine drip and have them determine how much relief they deserve. Or the McGill pain questionnaire, ask them, is your pain radiating, is it spreading, is it cruel, is it annoying? This is also the time period during which John Bonica is helping to create these new trends. And you might say, that the politics of pain begins to push back even further against restrictions. So the Controlled Substances Act has made LSD and marijuana and heroin Schedule I substances, but pain reformers are saying, but these are really central and helpful uh, tools in the management of pain. Why, could we, why should we not have them come back? This is the liberalizing trends at work. Um, John Bonica, in writing from the 1970s, says, undoubtedly one of the major revolutions in our concept of pain in the last 100 years is the gate control theory. The field of pain research, has, which had stagnated for almost a century, has recently been reborn. And his clinic grows in the context. His international and national stature uh, grows as well. Now, there were critics and skeptics of this gate control theory of pain. And one of them was Peter W. Nathan, a British neurologist, uh, and who was really interested in the rise of this theory, but also somewhat skeptical. He was skeptical for a number of reasonably good reasons. Um, he says the work underlying the gate control theory was uh, electrophysiological investigation in cats. And it really wasn't even focused on pain in cats. It was really an investigation of electrical stimulation and recording. But clinical neurologists who followed the advances read the papers in small mammals and tended to transpose what they learned to clinical neurology in man. So he was in some ways critical of the fact that this theory had been sort of swept by the zeitgeist into a kind of, to become a truism. But he also said the following. Although a theory has led, although the theory has led to successful treatments of chronic pain, that does not mean it's correct. Ideas, he said, need to be fruitful. They do not need to be right. And curiously enough, the two do not necessarily go together. This is surprising from a scientific perspective, but he was not only, uh, he also kind of put his money where his mouth is. So he said, look, if pain is so diverse and so many different methods are useful in its alleviation, and even if I'm skeptical of this gate control theory, he, alongside Patrick Wall, one of the originators, decided that they should begin research on this TENS unit, the transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, and guess what? It works. He's a skeptic of the gate control theory, but he himself is an innovator, helping to diversify approaches to dealing with chronic pain. Liberalization pushes boundaries in medicine so that when Richard Nixon goes to China, you might say there's a geopolitics of pain. Um, the theory of, it opens the door to China in multiple ways, and one of the things that comes back with the American appreciation of things Chinese is the theory of, of the use of acupuncture. As one observer in the New York Times wrote, the theory also helped to legitimate acupuncture, which most Western physicians had dismissed as a clever trick of auto suggestion. And here, you see an, a Los Angeles Times image on there being no consensus on why acupuncture works, but it does. The gate control theory says the nerve signals from the body can be gated. Um, a second theory says maybe this is just old-fashioned hypnotism. The debate continues on what's effective and what is not. In 1972, um, John Bonica is asked, because of course, acupuncture poses a threat and a challenge at the same time and an opportunity for people who have now created a field who now need to grapple with what should this particular new form of medicine mean for us. Acupuncture is being written about widely in the early 1970s. Uh, in the John Bonica papers at the University of uh, UCLA, which is where I spent a lot of my time doing this research, 
Uh, there's a letter, for instance, from a Miami anesthesiologist named Frank Moya who says, Dear John, to John Bonica, I'm literally being flooded with requests for referrals of patients to acupuncture centers. Regrettably, I know of very few physicians who are currently involved in acupuncture. Do you have any information I can use, qualified physicians to whom I can refer? And of course, John Bonica had no suggestions. But what John Bonica had was curiosity. Acupuncture posed a challenge. Here's a novel practice. The question is, does it work? How do we study its efficaciousness? Can we do clinical trials? Is patient testimony enough? If it works for one person, is it enough to say it's valid? How do you separate the ideology from the science? Well, what John Benica does is he goes to China. He goes to China in 1973 in the immediate wake of Nixon's return. He attends operations. He sees operations being conducted on patients. He documents the procedure. He observes patients. He interviews practitioners. He keeps an incredible diary, which becomes really useful for me. And it's really in this context that he's asked, you know, do doctors know what pain is? And he has to admit, you know, if you ask 100 different authors, uh, authorities, you get 100 different answers. This is the era in which even acupuncture is pushing the boundaries of what the expert knows. Um, it's also in this context that the liberalization of pain medicine suggests uh, for, John, for Ronald Melzack that the ph physician could and should base his therapy on more than just surgical in inter intervention, relaxants, tranquilizers, suggestions, placebos, hypnosis, whatever works. Pain medicine should be tailored to the patient's needs. This is the, really the high point of liberalization, individuation, and the respect for a subjective experience. The political context is also shifting, with hospice emerging in the late 60s, early 1970s. You might say there's a micropolitics and a macropolitics of who deserves relief. Terminal stage cancer patients, yes. People in chronic pain, hmm, not so sure. We need to sort of think about that. So you might say there are hierarchies of deservedness that emerge in medicine as well. And this is where you begin to see a turn in the political debate about pain. You see it early in the 1960s, building through the 70s, building through the 70s. For instance, in uh, 1972, a new NBC News report, pain, where does it hurt? Uh, the producer, Lucy Jarvis, right, is written about this is the coverage of it in the following day. You see it becomes a battleground over questions of welfare and politics. There is much more, says the news report, to the NBC program than that, of course. There is the segment on the low back losers who's learned pain, blow back pain, cost the state of California $102 million a year in compensation. This is one segment of the show. Another on burn cases, another on acupuncture as a plausible theory. So here you see a society trying to sort out, you know, where do you draw a line between legitimate pain and illegitimate pain? And then you see the emergence of this new idea of learned pain. It was learned pain, said Mrs. Jarvis, of one other case. What is learned pain? Well, the idea of learned pain was being developed. You might say if there are liberalizing trends, sorry, that uses a certain set of theories, gate control theory, to suggest liberalization, there are these new theories that emerge also in psychiatry through the work of Martin Seligman on theories of learned helplessness, which he writes about in the 1960s. And I won't go into detail, but he studies dogs who can be learned, taught to be accustomed to dealing with chronic pain, even though by moving into another part of the cage, they might escape the pain. They're restrained from reaching food, they learn not to try, and even with electrical shock, they do not budge. And he's interested in conditioning and how people become accustomed to their pain, how they learn that they cannot control bad events, and they become subdued, complacent. And these theories now migrate into the political discussion around pain, in the 1970s, you might say, uh, pain becomes an ideological struggle over governance. By the early 1980s, as looking back, one, one uh, observer writes that over the last 20 years, with the creation of the disability benefits, a significant number of federal cases were decided uh, in which the alleged disability was wholly or substantially related to pain. So if there's a liberal set of trends in the 60s and 70s uh, in the name of compassion, social justice, recognizing individuality, intersubjective understanding, and recognizing subjective pain as true pain warranting relief, you might say there's always been these conservative impulses 
that we saw with Henry Albranda that never quite disappeared, that reemerged in the late 1970s about the social consequences of overindulgence, the feeding of addiction, the creation of dependency and malingering, and the economic costs, and this is really crucial, the economic costs of building a compassionate society that costs money to maintain. And you see how this shows up both in the clinic as well as in the law. Stephen Brenna, uh, a pain specialist in Atlanta, writes more and more of what he called the learned pain syndrome. He's a former student of John Bonica. He writes of learned helplessness and chronic pain he calls a learned experience. He's, and he writes to John Bonica and John says, I share your concerns about the proliferation of so-called pain centers throughout the US and other countries. So even John Bonica, having built this system himself, is ambivalent about its spread. You see it in legal cases where some of the claimants who have been rejected by HEW go to the courts. And in new cases, you see judges weighing differently on this question. Courts begin to rethink subjective pain. Does the patient deserve truly disability benefits? You begin to see the shift from the Rosie Page standard, the liberal standard of subjective pain mattering, to the 1970s in the case of Miranda v. Richardson, a case in which the judge argues, pain is not easily diagnosed, but the secretary is not at the mercy of every claimant's subjective assertions of pain when determining eligibility for benefits. And as the 1970s come to an end, and a new president, a conservative president, who had long railed against the size of government, saw Medicare as a welfare program that was going to deprive Americans of fundamental liberties, comes to office, and he says in his inaugural address, government is not the solution to our problem, it's government, government is the problem. It's not surprising that when I went into the Reagan archives in Loma Linda, to look at the work that's being done around disability benefits in the first two months of his administration in the Office of Policy Development, you see those in his office grappling with how to roll back the expansiveness of not just government services, but also this disability program. One memo. What is the effect of the administration's proposal to scale back Social Security disability benefits? Peter Ferrara writes, over the years, the disability benefit provisions were significantly over-liberalized as compared with the original concept of paying such benefits only for truly permanent and total disability. The administration proposal would change back the definition of disability so that it would rest solely on medical grounds and would not take into account vague factors which are so difficult to determine in a consistent manner. Now, this trend had already been at work in the late stages of the Carter administration, so it's, it's, it would be too much to put the onus only on the Reagan revolution. Already in the last stages, the Carter administration was concerned about what they called disability fraud or pain fraud, but this is really heightened in the first uh, two years of the Reagan administration, and many observers see this, as does Charles Morris, he says, disability benefits had ballooned tenfold in 20 years to close to 15 billion. Growth was particularly rapid after the rules were broadened to include mental disabilities, addiction, and subjective states like intense back pain. Reagan attempted to impose rigorous new disability tests on the assumption that many of the so-called disabled were malingerers, and the roles were actually reduced by 10% before Congress halted the effort. Pain becomes in the bullseye, part of the pitched battle between liberals and conservatives over the commitments of government to those who are in need. And just like we have an IOM study that was done on this particular matter of controversy more recently, uh, an IOM study is done in the late 1980s on this very question. Should pain be understood as a fundamental disability? And if so, what should we do about pain? And that study concludes that making decisions about people who chronic from, suffer from chronic pain is one of the most troublesome problems facing by public and private insurers who determine eligibility for disability. The problem was brought into sharp focus in 1981 with what's called the purging of the roles. Uh, about a half a million people were removed from the disability roles, who were many of them subsequently having their benefits restored. This debate about the size and the scope and the commitment of government ultimately drove pain 
even more into the courts than ever before, with a class action suit coming from Lorraine Pulaski in the Pulaski v. Heckler case that's decided in 1984, in which the courts and ultimately Congress also have to weigh in. Ironic that it's the courts, judges and politicians who have to write laws that determine what pain is real pain and how pain should be judged. And you see them trying to what you might call thread the needle between liberal compassion and conservative skepticism. While the claimant has the burden of proving that the disability results from a medically determinable physical or mental impairment, direct medical evidence of the cause and effect relationship between the impairment and the decree of claimant's subjective complaints need not be produced. The adjudicator in any such case may not disregard a complainant's, a complainant's um, subjective complaint solely because the objective medical evidence does not fully support them. So I want to just close by, uh, it's, the 1980s are a fractious era in which, like today, Americans are grappling with two kinds of problems, as this Washington Post article highlights, undertreatment for fear of addiction. It's an irony of, uh, irony of our age, millions of Americans in hospitals, late stage cancer patients, burn victims, accident victims, suffer unnecessary, sometimes agonizing pain with doses of narcotic analgesics too low. And also, at the same time, over-medication. Uh, millions more unhospitalized are dangerously overdosing on painkillers, often inappropriately prescribed for their chronic pain. We've tried to also, you might say, the, the politics of pain has swung a pendulum from one to the other, really never trying to grapple with how these two problems could exist side by side. Amidst this, the rising awareness of racial and ethnic disparities in emergency room analgesic prescriptions, uh, racial disparities in late stage cancer uh, treatment. And also, when John Bonica uh, passes away in the 1990s, a new debate emerges around, and he dies at the Mayo Clinic, uh, around uh, a new tide of pain laws that are being passed in the 1990s. At first, in Texas and California, the Intractable Pain Acts, Pain Acts, Intractable Pain Treatment Acts, are being passed to sort of try to remove the threat of prosecution from physicians who, would, who are seeking to provide compassionate care to their um, patients. But as the story, as Oregon passes its Death with Dignity Act in 1994, the politics of pain shifts. And when Florida takes up an Intractable Pain Treatment Act, even though it's named precisely the same as the Texas and California law, this is seen as a new law that will threaten physicians who use analgesics in order to hasten death in any way. It, it, allow, it, it, it prompts the New York State Task Force to insist that efforts to characterize morphine as a form of covert euthanasia is extremely misguided. In our time period, pain remains a partisan issue. And the question of whose pain matters has become even more politically fractious than it was uh, in the 1980s. The Republican Party moved on with the rise of the religious right. And in the last, last stages, actually, of Reagan's uh, term, he discovered, you might say, a pain that, I mean, I'm not going to be overly political here, but he discovered a pain that Republicans could rally behind. And that was the, the assertion of fetal pain. Now, this, of course, is post Roe v. Wade, anti-abortion politics at work, the argument that the fetus experiences pain, the, re the emergence of a movie trying to symbolize the reality of that pain, despite the fact that neurologists say there's not enough neurological development to really support such a claim. But that doesn't really matter in the political and cultural realm. Fetal pain for Republicans, particularly conservative and religious Republicans, particularly in southern states, is a truth. And you begin to see in the 1990s and today the states who regard this pain as the pain that we should be legislating around. And you might say on the political left, you have death with dignity advocates, uh, other states rallying around compassionate care at the end of life. The rise not just of death with dignity laws, but also medical marijuana laws. I call this a kind of divided state of analgesia that we live in. 
where you have red states thinking about certain kinds of pains and blue states thinking about others and purple states in the middle trying to kind of thread the needle. And uh, when my book was reviewed in science, this is the image that they chose, which I think is wonderful, to kind of, kind of capture how pain becomes politicized, not just in our time period, but historically. And as with the Death with Dignity Act, and I'll end in one minute, it's the courts, once again, that have to decide. It's the judges who have to decide. When the Washington v. Glucksburg case was decided about you know, physician-assisted suicide, the court was asked, is there a constitutional right to die? And the courts decided, the, the, well, the AMA's position was a rejection of physician-assisted suicide, but a support for pain relief, even if it hastened death. The embrace of what's called the principle of double effect, an old concept from Catholic theology, Thomas Aquinas, um, the recognition that physicians should provide patients pain medication sufficient to ease their pain, even where that may see, serve to hasten death, is vital to ensuring that no patients suffer from physical pain. This is the argument that the AMA made, and this is the argument that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who was always a swing justice on the court, kind of pivoting between the conservatives and the liberals on the court, embraced. She argued that there is no dispute that dying patients in Washington and New York can obtain palliative care, even when doing so would hasten their deaths. It's an embrace of a new theory of pain, uh, the principle of double effect, in the courts. This produced a backlash uh, from conservative Republicans like Henry Hyde, who sought to pass what he called Pain Relief Promotion Act in 1994, which would permit the DEA to prosecute physicians who dispensed controlled substances for the purpose of hastening death. He wanted to empower the DEA to determine physicians' intent and whether the drug was dispensed for legitimate medical purposes or not. The bill failed. Marsha Angel, writing in the New England Journal of Medicine, said the title of the bill is misleading. If the bill becomes law, it will almost certainly discourage doctors from prescribing and administering adequate doses. This gives you a sense of the politics of pain in the 1990s and today. So I hope to kind of just illustrate for you why it is that pain medicine has been so controversial for so long and why the controversy has shifted from one terrain to the next. That's what I try to do in my book. And at the core, there are some questions that ripple through our cultural, our political, and our medical debates swirling around that physician as he or she tries to determine how much relief is necessary for any given patient. Pain, relief, and the judgment is a complex social calculation. It's a medical, scientific, and clinical dilemma, but it's also a political and ideological stalking horse. That is to say, it is people in pain, people in chronic pain, have in some ways served, but some ways victimized by this politics. I mean, when you're debating fetal pain on the one hand and end of life pain on the other hand, whose pain isn't at the center of the debate? It's people living with chronic pain. And this is a good example of how the politics of our time period can skew and push pain out of the public spotlight, out of clinical debates. Uh, but I would say that, you know, looking forward, the reform is always possible. If you follow the career of somebody like John Bonica, pain medicine changed so dramatically over his life. And as I said, you know, if, if Ronald Melzack could be astonished by the transformation that his modest theory of gate control pain uh, gave rise to, I think we can all be hopeful that, you know, as they say, tomorrow is always another day. So let me end there, and uh, maybe t I have about 10 minutes maybe for some questions, but thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity. Is 
dollars in debt so much you can yeah. you can get provider education and you can do consumer education and then participation and participation can change back to what was once everybody knew that a multimodal that's right so what I would like to understand or better understand is how it went wrong. Why did it take why did insurance why did reimbursement fall? When did you demonstrate that it worked? Why can you help us uh, illuminate <coughs> why reimbursement didn't fall? And I wrote some notes. Was it just too graphic? Was it pushed back the dense page of the papers? Was it too graphic in the idea of going to the police for the bill? I don't get it. Um, I would like to, for our sake, avoid a pitfall. Yeah. And Well, I mean, the politics around reimbursement is a huge question, and it's shadowed uh, many areas of, of medical decision making and judgment. Um, I would say that the insurance reimbursement has always favored discrete interventions, quick fixes that are arguably kind of economic and low cost. And pain. Chronic illness in general doesn't fit neatly, not just in an acute illness model, but it doesn't fit the kind of economic logic of the reimbursement uh, system that we have created really since the rise of HMOs and the rise of in the 1980s as well. So there's a kind of mismatch, you might say, between the way in which we've tried to limit costs, not just in government, but also in the private sector. And people with chronic illnesses are deemed to be problems in that system because we have a model of illness that doesn't match up with the model that prevails in the reimbursement system. So therein, you also need a kind of a cultural change. I'm not, I'm not optimistic that there is the possibility of a cultural change within the reimbursement system, but I do see that you know, there's been political pressure and cultural pressures brought to bear on, you might say, insurance and reimbursement from the outside to change the way they think about particular kinds of illnesses. So I, I'm, not, I, I'm not giving you a satisfying answer about where it went wrong, but I'd say that those reimbursement trends are really part and parcel of the trends that we saw in the, from the 1980s as well, the sort of the rise of a more business model of healthcare and the way in which chronic illness simply is a source of frustration for the business of healthcare and simply doesn't fit the model. So we need to re fundamentally rethink the model, the reimbursement model, as a business model of healthcare. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to be satisfying in giving that because it's such a huge question. One of the models that we have embraced is the accountable care organization mm -hmm. model, where the reimbursement ultimately is going to be one payer source, and we are responsible for the entire experience of care. That's going to put this whole question of chronic pain and chronic pain management into a much different light from a reimbursement perspective as well as a provider perspective. Right. So I just wonder if you have been reading anything about this whole ACO and how maybe chronic pain is going to be addressed within that kind of a model of delivery of care. Uh, well, I think you've articulated the challenge really nicely, and I should say two uh, words of maybe apology. One, as a historian, I'm more comfortable looking back than I am looking forward, uh, which is just an occupational risk. Um, but the other is that um, the, the, the way in which I've thought about pain really has really skimmed the surface. It's really a bird's eye view of the politics in relationship to clinical practice. The one thing I have not paid attention to in this book, which you are, your questions are reminding me is worth another investigation, is the way in which historically the rise of the reimbursement system um, has kind of shaped the possibilities of relief. Uh, there's a little bit of it in the book where the surgeons themselves were really aware of the fact that it was one thing to say that surgery was helpful for treating low back pain in the 1950s. And this is sort of the new approach. It's another thing to get the insurance companies to cover it. And one of the interesting things in the history of pain that may be worth looking at closely is how different medical groups 
have or have not been successful alongside patient groups in pushing for coverage and really pushing the, those who actually do reimbursement to expand the idea of what is coverable and what should be covered, right? That this is not something that happens only because a business decides they're going to cover a particular, this is something that happens in conversation and sometimes pressure from medical constituencies as well as patient constituencies. So maybe another book that I need to focus on. Probably don't need this. Dr. Waylu, thank you very much. I, uh, today was great, even though I was there last night, and I think I'm going to have to read your book. because. Uh, <laughs> but I want to ask you a question I'm sure is going to come up to others uh, later in the day, but your perspective is really important, I think. Um, uh, I'm a physician, oncologist, palliative care, hospice physician who trained in the 90s and practiced oncology palliative care and hospice in this era, and I really feel like even though in that era, yeah, education wasn't quite good enough, the, the medical culture wasn't quite good enough, but we were able to, in those settings, for the most part, with um, adequate uh, rational justification of our treatment to get patients what they needed in those settings, you know, maybe Maybe we had it better than primary care and other types of settings. We could get the patients the, the opiate and non-pharmacologic and other interventions they needed. And I think um, the teens, that is now. Also, I didn't understand what politics were happening while I was <laughs> training true. and practicing. And you've really brought amazing insight to that. I really feel like right now, in the last five years, there's a tidal wave about to hit uh, all of our practices with, um, you know, the, the upcoming restriction of our practice based on what's happening culturally with this perception and facts that show probably, um, you know, prescription drug abuse is, is become a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. um, but the pendulum swinging back and the politics of that, and I just didn't see the political slant to it in as clear of a way until I heard your presentation. And I, even as a historian, you, you have to be analyzing what's happening now. Right. And I just want to hear a little bit about the political perspective before we hear uh, other components yeah. later today about why so much uh, um, emphasis and um, concern and really demagoguery is happening right now. Right. Uh, that, that feels like it's going to limit right. physicians, nurses, all clinicians, medical practices, the reimbursement system, right. and going to keep us from being able to adequately treat our patients like I really felt like I could in the 1990s and the 2000s, but I'm more concerned than I ever have been in the teens, and the politics are frightening. Yeah. So here's a, uh, this is a variation on the question that Kathleen Foley asked me yesterday about. Um, we need to look really closely at the war on drugs and how that has played out in this realm. And here's what I would say. I'd say that I'm, I believe there's reason for optimism on this front. That despite the fact that there's a increasing, and there's always going to be a kind of public anxiety, concern about particular kinds of prescription drug or illegal drug use, whether it's heroin or Oxycontin. Um, and that clearly casts a shadow and, and circumscribes and somewhat limits what a, an individual physician can do. But at the same time, we're at a very interesting moment in the liberalization of drug laws as well. Whether it's the medical marijuana legislation that you see passed in certain states, but also, I think, a general recognition, and you know, I, I think I'm pretty safe in saying this, that, that we are now at a place where we're also, at the same time we're concerned about prescription drug uh, overuse, we're also concerned about the excesses of the war on drugs. That, and, and the key is to continue to, we're, we're, we debate the, the unintended effects of waging a war on drugs, 
Um, I just finished giving a lecture on you know, anxieties about crack cocaine in the 1980s that never really came to pass. There's not a generation of what you might call crack babies. Um, it was a kind of a myth of the time, really shaped by the intense anxiety. But nowadays what we deal with is the fact that we created sentencing laws that have sent you know, many, many men and women to prison for long periods of time. And now we're debating kind of scaling back those sentencing laws. So whether it's the rolling back of the Rockefeller drug laws in 2010, the legalization of marijuana, I think we're in a very different moment here, which is not to say that the hysteria around prescription drugs will subside. It's just going to be counterbalanced against an awareness that limiting drugs because you're concerned about one set of excess isn't really going to address a fundamental and growing problem in society. What I, what I like to say is we, we have a kind of a pendulum swing approach right, in our society. Either you get rid of drugs or we need more. Either it's over-treatment or under-treatment. What we need as a society is to understand that we might have two problems at the same time. They have different origins and they're different solutions. And you know, if I were to say anything about pain reform, it's that you have to go forward with an awareness that you have to tackle both of these issues at the same time. And you can't make the solution to one cost, you know, a, a huge cost to the other. That's gonna be the challenge, I think, going forward, is how do you do both at the same time? I think I'm out of time. I can see Myra rising. Thank you.